my fellow Whovians, how you guys doing? This is Alan with another Doctor Who review for you. Today I'm going to review the 23rd Doctor Who story, The Ark, starring William Hartnell as the first Doctor. And in this story, the Doctor and his two companions, Stephen and Dodo, they land the TARDIS on an intergalactic Ark, a great big gigantic spaceship uh, containing not only members of the human race, but also various animals of all different kinds, as well as an alien race called the monoids which are basically these uh, weird looking aliens they've got like like uh, they only have one eyeball and they've got like really huge uh, oversized beetles haircuts and big webbed feet and they waddle around and basically the monoids serve the humans and the doctor and his TARDIS crew discover that these humans on board this ark they are fleeing from the planet earth because this is roughly the year 10 million AD give or take a few thousand or a few hundred thousand or a few million years and the earth is in its last days and the human race has to get the hell off the planet earth and find a new planet to live on and that planet is a planet somewhere in the far off distant galaxy called Refusus and it's going to take the human race oh about 700 years to get there so they packed on board all the members of the human race that they possibly could many of them in microscopic form and they're heading to the planet refuses but yeah it's going to take them about 700 years to get there so at first everything's all fine and dandy but then one little problem rears its head and that is you see when the doctor and Stephen and Dodo came on board the ark it turns out that Dodo had a little bit of a head cold a little bit of a sneeze a little bit of blowing her nose and all that she wasn't feeling too well and unfortunately she passed her head cold virus on to the people and the monoids on board the ark and since they have never had to deal with the common cold since apparently the common cold was eradicated millions of years ago they start dying from it so it's up to the doctor to come up with a cure for these people for the common cold now i don't think i'm giving anything away when i say that uh the doctor obviously does come up with a with a cure for these people uh, of, of, of the common cold and they thank him and the doctor and Stephen and Dodo they they wish that the people on board the ark you know a, a safe journey and they leave in the TARDIS but then they come back to the ark and it's now 700 years later and the ark is now finally at long last about to land on Refusus but the doctor and crew discover that one small thing one small thing has happened while they were away the monoids are now in charge of the ark something has gone wrong between the humans and the monoids while the doctor and crew were away and so now the monoids are in charge and the humans are now the servants and so it's up to the doctor and crew to get the humans and the monoids to stop their bickering and hopefully get them to live in peace and harmony on the planet Refusus with the very very interesting refusions who live there <clears throat> Basically, there you go. That's The Ark. The Ark is a Doctor Who story that I really, really enjoyed a whole lot when I was a kid, when I first saw it on my local TV channel, uh, KTEH, in San Jose, California. I enjoyed The Ark very, very much uh, back then when I was a whole lot younger, and I did think at the time that it was one of William Hartnell's very best stories. But you know what? Looking at The Ark now as an adult, you know... I'm going to give it a passing grade, just a marginal passing grade. It's still a decent Doctor Who story, but, you know, looking at it now, it's got a lot of silliness in it. There's a whole lot of silliness going on uh, in, in the arc. For one thing, the humans are dressed in togas and sandals. These are people from like 10 million some odd years in the future, and they're all wearing togas and sandals. Why? Uh, and, and then in the second half of the story, we're supposed to believe that it's 700 years later and the humans are still wearing togas and sandals. I mean, in all that time, in all those hundreds and hundreds of years, nobody on board the Ark that came up with the idea, you know, guys, I'm really getting sick and tired of wearing the, these togas and sandals. Let, let, let's wear some other kinds of clothes or something like that. Why togas and sandals? Why? I mean, the humans, they look so silly in, in their outfits in, in, in this story. I mean, that's something that, that didn't really bother me at the time when I saw it as a kid, but now... I know they just look so silly. I mean, okay, the women look pretty good yeah, in these outfits, but I mean, I, they, but overall, they, they just look so silly. And then, of course, there's the monoids. The monoids, you know, it doesn't really surprise me that the monoids never came back to Doctor Who ever again. They're not the greatest of uh, monsters, even though, okay, they're not necessarily forgettable uh, aliens. They're just kind of silly aliens because, you know, they, they have that one eyeball, which is obviously, let's see, according to Wikipedia, it's really a golf ball in the person's mouth, the person. In, in the monoid outfit it's it's a golf ball and they're manipulating the golf ball you know with, with their tongue 
And, of course, all the monoids have got these overgrown beetles haircuts that cover up their eyes. I don't know how the hell the people in those monoid outfits could see. And the fact that they got these big webbed feet and they waddle. And uh, and they're kind of like the uh, the sensorites. Remember the sensorites from the earlier William Hartnell story where uh, they all have to wear, like, this sash over their uh, collars so you can tell who they are. And, and I don't know. They're not the strongest of aliens, I think, in, in the history of Doctor Who. What else? I, I think another problem with the arc really is is the script. Uh, the script is credited to Paul Erickson and Leslie Scott, who at the time were husband and wife. According to Wikipedia, Leslie Scott didn't write a single word of the script. <laughs> Thank goodness for her, but unfortunately for her, her name is on this because her, her then husband at the time, Paul Erickson, said, I want my wife to have co-writing credit on this script. And she got it even though she didn't write anything for this story. This is this script is entirely Paul Erickson's doing, and Paul Erickson, he never wrote for Doctor Who ever again. It doesn't surprise me. Uh, the quality of the script, and I listen to it now, it sounds very pedestrian. Uh, some of the words that, uh, in fact, a lot of the words that the characters have to speak to each other in the story are pretty silly stuff, just, just really, really silly. I also think the supporting cast of this story really suffer because of it. Nobody in the supporting cast gets a moment to shine. There are no standout performances at all from anyone in the supporting cast of this story. That Their characters are all so underdeveloped and that the script they're working with is just so weak and I don't think anybody in the supporting cast of the arc was able to work any magic with this very pedestrian sounding script. I do think that the regulars in the cast, William Hartnell, uh, Peter Purvis as Stephen, and uh, Jackie Lane as Dodo, they come off really well. But I mean, hey, they're the regulars of the cast. They know what to do. But uh, the supporting players in the arc, I think they were all pretty much just lost at sea with this script. It's it's just not a good script. It's just, just very weak. Is there anything about the arc that I did like? Well, you know, look, I, I like the whole concept of the arc. I mean, I, I like the idea of it, that it's basically two stories in one. And I like the idea of an intergalactic arc taking the human race or the, you know, the survivors of the human race to a better planet. And they have this alien race as their servants. And then we get to the second half of the story and everything flips around between the humans and the monoids. And now the monoids are running the show and the humans are now the servants. Um, I like that. I was disappointed, though, with the Refusians. When we finally get to the planet Refusus, the Refusians, they're invisible. Okay, and it's explained that they're invisible because there was a solar flare that happened on Refusus that, that rendered every single one of them invisible. Although, actually, there's really only one Refusian. We only hear one Refusian's voice. But yeah, apparently a solar flare happened and boom, now all of a sudden the, the Refusian race are invisible. To me, it's just kind of silly. You know, I, I just it just doesn't quite work for me. You know, William Hartnell has to do his best talking to nothing that's there. It's not very convincing. But you know what? It's a harmless Doctor Who story. It wants to entertain you. And I think even in, in its goofy way, it's a Doctor Who story that, you know, it's, it's trying to be a breath of fresh air, if you like, after the very dark, grim previous Doctor Who story, The Massacre. So the arc was obviously a nice antithesis to The Massacre. Now, by the way, I, I like The Massacre, but it's a very, very dark Doctor Who story. So the arc is a very nice, you know, lighter Doctor Who story. Oh, much, much lighter Doctor Who story that the whole family can enjoy. But I just think that the script is very, very weak. It's just, I'm um, Paul Erickson. It doesn't surprise me that this guy never wrote for Doctor Who ever again. It's just not a very good script. The dialogue, you know, the quality of the dialogue is just not very good. But nonetheless, I do like the concept of this story, and I do think that the three main regulars, William Hartnell, Peter Purvis, and Jackie Lane, are all still very good. They help carry the story along. Whenever the three of them are on screen, at least you can see they're trying hard uh, with, with this script. It's nice to see another sci-fi Doctor Who story, rather one that's historical. I always like it when we go into space or something like that. Not that I'm going to love every single sci-fi-esque Doctor Who story, but I appreciate it. I mean, they tried, but I don't think they tried hard enough with the arc. It could have been much better. If it had just been written much better, if there had just been a little more tension, this could have been a great Doctor Who story. It could have been one of my all-time favorites of Doctor Who, certainly one of my all-time favorite William Hartnell stories. Looking at it now, it's decent, it's okay, it has its moments of entertainment, and again, I appreciate that it's, it's a nice 
refreshing change from the dark previous story, The Massacre. It has its moments of fun, and as I've said, the concept of it is good. I just wish the script had been better. The arc is not as good a story as I remembered it to be when I was a kid, but despite its flaws, yeah, it's still a good story. Now, the next Doctor Who story is The Celestial Toymaker, and it's considered a Doctor Who classic and a William Hartnell classic. Unfortunately, three of its four episodes are missing. So I'm going to review Celestial Toymaker, watching the reconstructed episodes on YouTube, and watching the fourth episode, which does exist, on the Lost in Time box set, and I will come back and review it for you. So that's it, folks. I'm Alan. Thank you for watching, and I'll be back next time on Doctor Who Review with The Celestial Toymaker. Bye-bye.